This is Cambridge IGCC for biology paper four, theory standard. Assessment paper for examination from 2023. Question number one. A, figure 1.1 is a photomicrograph showing a surface view of many villi in the small intestine. One, state the function of villi. There will be for absorption of digested food. Or should I say nutrients? Nutrients into the blood. This is pretty straightforward. Moving on to two, describe the structure of a villus. So as you can see, it is folded, right? It is folded. And then uh, in terms of the actual structure, there is a lacteal. Right, let me just draw like a rough sketch. These are villus, and then you see essentially the center, there's a lacteal. And then there's blood vessels. And yeah. It is only a rough sketch, okay? You can check from uh, Google for an actual diagram. And then, yeah, pretty much the idea of this. Actually, this is more of a capillaries, okay? Blood capillaries surrounding the lacteal. So they are, it's rich in blood capillaries. And then you can also talk about the, it has a large surface area, which means that uh, due to its folder structure. And then what else? You can talk about the, put the epithelium here, like surrounded by an epithelium. But I think that's a little bit hard to relate because I guess the part that leaves the most impression is the capillary and also the lacteal, right? So I guess you can talk about lacteal reaching blood capillaries and also the large surface area. All right. So uh, you can also talk about epithelium that contains goblet cells, which means uh, mucus producing cells, right? Right. So that's pretty much the answer for two. You have three points. So at least give me three points in order to score all of the marks. Moving on to B1. Blood transports nutrients. State the component of the blood that transports nutrients. There will be the plasma, right? The liquid part of the blood. Moving on to two, the nutrients in the blood can be used to become part of cells. State the name of this process. So this assimilation, right? The keyword here is become part of cells, right? That's assimilation. Moving on to three, amino acids are used to make proteins. State two examples of proteins that are found in the blood. So like enzymes, for example. Enzymes, you can also talk about antibodies, right? Antibodies are also can be made from enzymes. And then what else? Actually, there's so many that I can't... Let me rephrase everything. It's like... Hormones, right? Protein hormones, insulin, glucagon, etc. So there's many possible answers. All right. Also, even like hemoglobin in, you know, red blood cells, there's also another protein that can be found in the blood. Or even you can talk about like plasma proteins like fibrinogen. All right. Many possible answers. C, explain the effect, sorry, the effect of cholera, cholera bacteria on the digestive system. So cholera bacteria, essentially, they produce toxins. These toxins lead to leakage of chloride ions from the intestine, and then also followed by diffusion of water via osmosis to the uh, lumen of the intestine, which ultimately leads to diarrhea. Right? So you need to mention the whole acid. So with that said, you can see that the cholera bacteria produces toxin and this leads to the secretion of chloride ions from the intestine into the small intestine and then followed by the lowering of water potential in the intestinal lumen 
then hence water moves into the gut via osmosis and that actually leads ultimately leads to diarrhea All right pretty straightforward but you need to remember the cause and effect and all of the sequences all right so cholera bacteria toxin leads to this chloride ions leads secretion of chloride ions into the small intestine leads to lowering of water potential in this area hence water moves into the intestine via osmosis and that leads to diarrhea all right the sequence is important moving on to the next question two insulin is a hormone that regulates the concentration of glucose in the blood describe what is meant by the term hormone so hormone is a chemical substance secreted by endocrine glands and then it is the medium is using the blood right the blood carries hormone and essentially hormone instructs right they instruct the out they alter the activity of specific target organs all right moving on to b person a and person b were monitored to see how well they could control their blood glucose concentration they did not eat or drink anything other than water for eight hours before the monitoring began they then drank a glucose solution blood samples were taken at 30 minute intervals the blood samples were tested for glucose concentration the results are shown in figure 2.1 One, calculate the percentage increase in the blood glucose concentration in person A between 60 to 90 minutes. Give your answer to the nearest whole number. So let's look at 60 and 90 and for person A. The values are 72 and 170 right so the the increase the absolute increase in this uh, question is taking 170 minus 72 technically the unit is that thing milligram per 100 cm cube so that gives you 98 right so what you do is the percent increase formula is always a fraction of the increase comparing to the original multiply by 100 percent so what's the increase here 98 over what's the original value it's the 60 minute so it's 72 multiplied by 100 percent that is actually a let's use calculator for that so divided by 72 it's the 136 percent all right moving on to the next question Two, using figure 2.1, compare the response of person A with the person or person B after the ingestion of glucose. When does the ingestion occur? Here, right, at the 30 minute part. But the increase begins after 60 minutes. Is the increase part for the for A at least, and then for B actually increase for a short period and then followed by decrease. So you can see that the period of increase and decrease are different for these two people. Right? So with that said, let's mention that. So 
what we see is person A, let, let me just draw a table because this is a comparison, right? So in exam, please write them in sentences, but allow me to draw the table so that it's clear. So what do we see here is that the for A, person A, the increase begins from 60 to 180 minutes. Which is actually a like longer period of increase. But for person B, what I see here is that the increase is very short. Increases between 60 to 90 minutes, which is a shorter period of increase. And then apart from that, what I see, there's actually a very huge like difference in the blood glucose concentration, I also see that person A has a relatively higher range of blood glucose level comparing to person B after the ingestion. So I will say that, actually we can also mention because we're comparing, so actually we can compare the similarities, which is the effect takes place after 60 minutes, right? So effect takes place actually in accordance to the glucose, you know, intake, it effect takes place after 30 minutes of ingestion. And what are the differences that we can talk about? The Increase in A is much more steep, as mentioned just now. Increase in A is much steeper. And then increase in B is less steep. So as you can see from the diagram, like this one big, this one is quite small. And what else? So leading to a higher concentration, a higher peak concentration, if you want to quote the data, feel free to do so. At this one, if you want to quote it, it's about 210. Whereas this one has, is less steep also, the peak concentration is lower. At how much is that? Only at 100 milligram per 100 cubic centimeters. Right. So, essentially, any three points. So, let me see the question, the mark scheme. So, the first mark is this one. Similar response in after 30 minutes of ingestion. And then, increase more steep in A and increase to a high concentration and then the decrease period is much later comparing to B and then for B oh you can also talk about it does not return to the in A right you see it doesn't return to the original baseline so it does not return to the original baseline. So as long as your answers make sense in relevant, that is relevant to the question, you should be able to get marks, right? Or A, right? So that's it. Uh, in exam, please write them in full sentences. Don't write in a table. I'm just doing a table for you to see the differences. Using figure 2.1, Explain the response of person B after 90 minutes. Then all. Essentially, this is an insulin response, right? Because insulin brings down the glucose concentration. So how does it do that? So let's just mention the, you know, the workflow. So after ingestion of glucose, Our body, the, the body of person B, 
responses to that by, you know, the pancreas reacts to that by secretes insulin. And essentially, insulin will start to, well, Wait, wait, actually I've overlooked one thing. We can talk about blood glucose concentration increases. And the direct stimulus is this one. This is an internal body stimulus. This stimulus stimulates the action of pancreas secreting insulin. Right. So it stimulates. And then the insulin will essentially cause the decline in blood glucose concentration then by how does it do that essentially leading to storage right glucose is converted to glycogen in the liver so essentially it's this insulin it stimulates wait allow me to rephrase this one putting at the bottom this one this is more of a downstream effect. So I will see that this one comes first. Essentially, it stimulates glucose uptake by the liver. Glucose uptake by the liver. Increases, leading to glucose converted to liver. Sorry, glucose converted to glycogen in the liver. And then followed by declining blood glucose concentration. Right, so essentially I have like about five points here. So it should be enough for four points. Right, let me look at the masking. What else can you say about this question? Nothing much, nothing much. Actually pretty similar to what I just gave you. All right, moving on to the next question. Person A had type 1 diabetes. Outline the treatment of type 1 diabetes. So the most popular one being insulin injections. All right, and then other than you know the traditional you know injection treatment, they talk about like you know being more conscious about diet and exercise. Like that's how you know doctors encourage patients with diabetes like do more diet, like control, uh, maintain you know a low carbohydrate diet, for example. So of low carbs, right? Low carbohydrate diet, and then also exercise more, exercise regularly. Right. Other than that, we can also talk about constantly monitoring blood glucose level using like you know proper machines to you know just detect, like check it daily, monitor blood glucose level regularly. Right. So let me see the answer scheme real quick. So intake of insulin is one mark, injection is one mark, monitoring of blood glucose level, one another mark, and then the controlling. Carbohydrate intake is another mark, and then exercise regularly is also another mark. All right, so moving on to the next question. Three, figure 3.1 shows a photomicrograph of human blood. A, describe the differences in appearance and function of the three cells labeled in figure 3.1. So the three cells are phagocytes, lymphocytes, and red blood cells respectively. So you have six marks. So I believe that three marks for appearance and three marks for function, right? So let's map it out as usual, right in a sentence form in your real exam. I'm just here to map out the idea. So appearance wise, how does red blood cell, phagocyte and lymphocytes look like? So phagocytes, right, it looks it has a lot nucleus, right? Or should you can see it as C-shaped nucleus, or you can say that it's irregularly shaped. So with that said, what's the function of phagocytes? They do phagocytosis, engulfing pathogens essentially. And then for lymphocytes, how do they look like? They have a larger nucleus. Right, very little cytoplasm. And what's the function here? They produce 
entire bodies. Right, you can also talk about their functions in uh, what they call it, responding to antigens and then, you know, about like related to memory cells, essentially. And then red blood cells, what's the function? Oops, I just dropped my pen. Allow me to put it up quickly. So the last one, red blood cells, right, is by concave in shape. Right, they are by concave and also you can talk about they don't have nucleus. So what they do, they transport oxygen, right? Because they have hemoglobin. So with that said, actually pretty straightforward. And they are actually usually smaller than white blood cells, right? So having these six points allow you to get six marks. Moving on to B, figure 3.2 shows some of the stages of blood clotting. One, complete figure 3.2 by filling in the two boxes. Let's see. So a blood vessel breaks, platelet collect at the break in the blood vessel. So what does platelet do? Essentially, it leads to fibrinogen, which is a plasma protein in the blood being converted into its insoluble form known as fibrin, just like fibers. Okay, so this network of fibrin forms a mesh at the break in the blood vessel. Now two, state two rows of blood clotting. Prevent excessive blood loss. Right, you want to you want essentially like the injury to stop stop bleeding. So it has to get clot. Like you have to form a clot and cover the spot. And then also, what else? You can also talk about prevent the entry of pathogens. Because essentially you are extremely vulnerable if you have an open wound. Pathogens can go in and infect your body. So that's not good. So these are the two main purposes of blood clotting. Moving on to C, hemophilia is a sex-linked blood disorder. The blood of people with hemophilia takes longer to clot. Figure 3.3 is a pedigree diagram showing the inheritance of hemophilia. The allele for normal clot time is represented by X capital H. The allele for hemophilia is represented by X with an uncapitalized H. State the genotypes of the people identified as P, Q, and R in figure 3.3. Let's see. So the squares are male. And the uh, circles are females. Right? So the we know that males have XY and then females has XX as is, you know, as the sex chromosomes. So what do we have here? You are the next generation has offspring with and without hemophilia which means that one of the parents is having hemo hemophilia or maybe two of the parents let's see the most likely answer so with that said let me put it as a uh, heterozygous Because you see, all the all the females are normal. All the females are normal. Which means that it's masked, right? It's masked. It's a carrier. All right, this is a carrier. And then male essentially, if it's if it has one X, you know, this uh recessive allele, so it will essentially get a disease. So this one, right, Q is just having a recessive allele which is having hemophilia, and then, okay, Q is quite straightforward. Q is just, you take, it's a sex link, means that it occurs only in X, right? So Q is pretty straightforward. The X chromosome has a recessive allele, followed by Y. And then for R, 
it's a meal, right? So most likely he has, not most likely, it's definitely normal allele X. Make sense? Like actually, uh, I shouldn't have discussed P first. Q and R are the most obvious. Q, it's he's a sufferer from the disease, so it must have a he must have a recessive allele. And then for R, he's a non-sufferer of the disease. He must be a like having the dominant form of the allele. It's just P that is the question. So we see the male is a non-sufferer, so most likely he's a dominant allele. But the female doesn't have the characteristics of hemophilia, which means that she's a carrier, carrier, sorry. Carrier, which means that he she's she's heterozygous. Right? Oh wow. Right, you need to analyze it. Maybe uh, I would say this question is easier if you analyze it from the bottom up, and then you can lead to this conclusion that the female of this generation is a car carrier. Okay, moving on to two. The couple S and T are expecting another child. Still, the probability that the child will have hemophilia, as mentioned. So, this is a normal male, dominant. Even that the offspring is having, you know, hemophilia, which means that this female must be a carrier. So let's draw a, let's do some crossing here. So with that said, this, these are the possible alleles. So what do we see here? As usual, let's cross them. So the strategy is one, four, one, sorry, one, three, one, four, two, three, two, four. So with that said, you will have normal female, normal male, a carrier female, and also a male who is having hemophilia. So the the chances of a child having like suffering from hemophilia is actually twenty five percent, right? Twenty five percent, or should I say zero point two five? All right, so three, describe what is meant by the term sex-linked characteristic, which means that the gene is only located at sex chromosome, hence the word sex-linked, and the characteristic is more common in one sex than the other. All right, moving on to the next question. For A, yeast can respire aerobically and anaerobically. State the balance equation for aerobic respiration. So chemical equation. Let's start with basic word equation first. So how is, what is aerobic respiration? Glucose plus oxygen forming carbon dioxide and water and actually energy, but for the chemical equation, we don't have to write that down. So with that see, let's translate these chemicals. So glucose is C6H12O6, oxygen is O2, carbon dioxide is CO2, water is H2O. So let me just copy it down real quick. Now, next is balancing. It's easier for you to balance the carbon first. Six carbon. So six carbon dioxide. And then for the hydrogen. Okay, usually in, in an equation related to an organic compound with oxygen, it's easier for you to balance the carbon then followed by the hydrogen. All right, so hydrogen is 12, so it will be putting a 6 here, and then all together, oxygen on the right, there's actually 18 oxygen in total, which makes here, you must put a 6 in order to make everything all together, 18 oxygen. Now, if you can't do balancing, remember that the coefficients of the remaining substances are 6, only glucose having a 1 as the coefficient. Right, moving on to B, 
when yeast respires anaerobically, ethanol is produced. Ethanol is a type of sustainable resource, sorry, resource that can be made from a wide range of crop plants. It can be used as a biofuel. Table 4.1 summarizes some information about crop plants that are used to make biofuel. A country has a mean temperature range of 12 degrees Celsius to 24 degrees Celsius. The country has a mean annual rainfall rainfall of a thousand millimeters. Suggest and explain which crop plant will be the most suitable crop to grow to produce biofuel in the country. Use the information in table 4.1 to support your choice. So you want to have a crop plant that fulfills these two requirements. So 12 to 24, essentially the last two will not be suitable because their optimum growth temperature is out, is 28. And regarding the rainfall, all three of them are suitable, right? They are they are falling between the the in the range actually, right? A thousand is in these three ranges. So you have to look at other metrics now. It is sugar beet because you see it has the best energy yield, the highest energy yield out of the options, right? Out of the remaining options. So the answer here is sugar beet why because first of all you can talk about the optimum growth temperature it falls within wait should i say let me let me just write uh, in a better phrasing maybe i can talk about the optimum growth temperature Falls in the range of of the country's mean temperature range. We can also talk about the optimum annual. It's literally the same answer, but instead the subject now is. Based on the rainfall. Right. So these are the two metrics that we judged previously. And the last metric that we judge is based on the energy U highest energy U compared to the other two which is wheat and corn All right moving on to the next question C describe and explain how a reduced concentration of water vapor in the air would increase the movement of water through Top plants. So, this question is about now what's the most direct response with drier conditions in the surrounding, or should I say at a lower humidity? It is, and plus it's related to water. So, you should think of transpiration. So transpiration rate increases when humidity is low. Right. Why? Why is that the case? It's due to greater concentration of water vapor inside the leaf than the outside. If you want me to draw it out, I can draw it out for you. So the plant, the outside has low water vapor, but the leaves have higher water vapor. So you would expect it to diffuse out, right? More transpiration essentially. So that leads to more 
water vapor diffuses out of the leaf via the stomata and this leads to essentially there's a it's like a suction force right so there's a transpiration pool all right leading to more water movement upwards the in the xylem Right, moving on to D. Sugarcane is a crop plant that is usually grown from, sorry, grown from stem cuttings rather than from seeds. Describe the advantages of using cuttings rather than seeds to reproduce crop plants. So you must know your cut these cuttings and the seeds well, which is cuttings are asexual reproduction. It's a form of asexual reproduction in plants. So this question is about what's the benefit of asexual reproduction? then sexual reproduction right seeds are formed as a result of sexual reproduction and then using cutting cutting is a form of asexual reproduction as usual as usual let me draw a slight table actually no need right this is more of an advantage you're not exactly comparing the differences although you can but not exactly right so what's the benefit of that Usually, why do we do asexual reproduction? Why do we use cuttings? We're cloning. Right, it's a form of cloning. Remember, asexual reproduction is a form of cloning. So, essentially, if, the, if there's a plant which has the best breed out of all, you would like to clone them as much as possible. Right, you want to give rise to uniform crop with the same characteristics right so essentially you want the desired traits okay consistency of desired traits are maintained plus it has a faster production comparing to seeds So this is more of a plant biology part of the syllabus. All right. So what else can we talk about? Let me check at the mark scheme real quick. Oh, the, the word asexual reproduction is another mark. So you have four marks here. Asexual reproduction, giving a uniform crop, crop or should I say, with minimal genetic variation. Essentially, having the same characteristic as a third part, third mark, and then consistency of the desired traits have the same feature, and also, yeah, and then you have the faster production, which is in total five marks that are possible in this question. Moving on to question number five, figure 5.1 shows the marine iguana, Amblyrhynchus cristatus. A1. Marine iguanas are reptiles. State two features that are used to classify animals as reptiles. So, reptiles, they produce leathery eggs. Right. And also, they have dry, scaly skin. Right. Right, moving on to two. Speak two structures that are present in plant cells that are not present in the cells of reptiles. So reptiles are just animals. So this question is about what's extra in plant cells than animal cells. So about the presence of chloroplasts, the presence of a cell wall, the presence of a large permanent vacuole. Right, moving on to B. Marine iguanas feed on seaweed. Seaweed contains starch. State the names of two parts of the digestive system where starch is digested by enzymes. There will be the mouth and also the small intestine. All right, 
starch digestion occurs at two parts of the body, the mouth and also the intestine. Moving on to two, stick why the shape of an enzyme is important for digestion. So you see the word steep shape of an enzyme, you should think of active sites. And what is the active sites for? They are complementary to the substrate. Right, so let me just copy this down real quick and start writing our essay here. So we can talk about active site. So it must be complementary to the substrate and allowing enzyme substrate complex to form. Followed by catalysis. Right, so this is binding to the enzyme. You can mention that bind to the the enzyme binds to the substrate. And also you can talk about only fits, only is specific to the substrate. All right, so the first part is the active site. The binding is also another mark. The specificity of enzyme to its substrate is also another mark. The complementary part to the substrate is also another mark. And then the last mark is on this one the enzyme substrate complex formation. So essentially, these are five points that you can write about. Actually, more of four points. Let me check. The mark scheme, it says that there's only four points. The The binding to the enzyme and also the allowing enzyme substrate complex to form is considered as the same mark. So this question only has four possible marks. And then essentially you need three of them to get the full mark. I can understand why. Because the binding, yeah, essentially it's pretty obvious. Enzyme substrate complex forms. So C, there are many threats to species such as the Mary iguana. Describe ways endangered plant and animal species can be conserved. Five marks. Oh, wow. You can write as much as you wanted. There's so much space here. Now, let's see. Let's see. Let's think about it for a second. There's so many that I need to take a moment to concise everything. Captive breeding programs. Right. And then you can talk about set up zoos. Right. Set up reserves. What else? We also talk about helping them to reproduce artificial insemination. Right, so this question is about endangered, right? Endangered. Oh, by the way, this part is more of uh, animals first. What else? Maybe controlled hunting. Right, so you can talk about actually education is also another point. Spreading awareness through campaigns, right? Spreading awareness through proper campaigns. And then what else? Like prevent hunting. Actually, it's reduce reduction of hunting. It's very hard to prevent hunting. I would say reduce hunting, right? Uh, reduce like pollution. For example, maybe we are essentially destroying the habitat, so we can reduce pollution, and then you know reduce introduction of species. Uh, this one is a little bit hard to talk about. Maybe let's pick easy ones. And then we are focusing on plants so far, except for the education. Education also applies for plants. So let's talk about plants for a second. So plants you have, we have seed banks. Right, seed banks. We can make up our new 
natural national forest, although national forest also applies for essentially serve as a habitat for the animals as well. Then you can also talk about botanical gardens. There's so many things that you can talk about. And I think you can very easily score more than five marks for this question. All right, just don't give up. Just keep on writing. And then uh, as long as it doesn't contradict your answers, you should be able to get all five marks in total. All right, I'm not going to write more. I think it's pretty much good enough. Let's look at number six. Wetlands are important ecosystems. Researchers study the feeding relationships between the organisms in an area of coastal wetland. Figure 6.1 shows part of the food web that they studied. A. Complete table 6.1 by giving the name of one organism from the food web in 6.1 for each row. So which is the producer, the algae and the phytoplankton, which is located at the first tropic level. So one organism only, so just let's just man mention algae. Or phytoplankton. And then secondary consumer, let's see. So essentially, this is the first consumer, this is the second consumer. So let's talk about Blenny. Actually, there's many answers. You can see as long as it's on the third tropic level, like this shrimps, shrimps, stone crab is also okay. And then the last question is an animal that feeds on feeds at two tropic levels. There will be the bladding, right? Two tropic levels. One is on the third, sorry, the fourth tropic level, the other one is on the third tropic level. So bladding. Right. Even the spotted sandpiper is also another animal that actually feeds on two tropic levels. If you notice closely, right, one, this is five tropic levels, this is four tropic levels. Moving on to the next question. The functioning of ecosystems relies on the cycling of nutrients. Figure 6.2 shows part of the nitrogen cycle. One, state the name of process A in figure 6.2 and give the type of organism that converts ammonium ions to nitrate ions. So this will be the nitrifying bacteria. So this is nitrification. All right, moving on to two. Describe how the nitrate ions used in process C Enter the roots of plants. It is a three marks question. So let's start with basic first. Mineral ions usually enter the roots of plants via active transport. So essentially, I think you can mention how active transport is carried out. So active transport is a movement of substances from a region of low to high concentration and then this process actually requires energy right so also requires the help of protein what else oh we can also talk about root hair essentially increasing the rate of uh, the uptake Yeah, actually, there's many points that you can write about. Let me look at the mark scheme. You can mention also the across-cell membranes. Also mention about, yeah, that's pretty much it. So it's your understanding of active transport and elaborate further. All right, moving on to three, state the name of structure in plant cells where process D occurs. So amino acid converted, or should I say polymerized to become protein. This is at the ribosome, which are protein factories of the cell. Moving on to four, 
Still, the process that occurs at B. Let's look at B. So this is nitrogen in its gaseous form, converting to a biological form, biologically available form. So processes that convert gases into a biologically available form is generally coined the term fixation. So it's called nitrogen fixation. All right, moving on to the, I believe this is the last question. Yeah, this is the last question. So a pyramid of numbers of the wetland ecosystem show that there were very large numbers of organisms at the base of the pyramid and very few at the top. Explain why. So you have to mention about the energy, right? It's unable to sustain the higher trophic levels. Why? Because energy is lost between trophic levels, right? It's just like a battery that keeps on losing power as it progresses up, right? It's used at here, use it here, use it here. So very little battery is left. So with that said, you can mention about the examples of the activity. So for example, right, all during all tropical levels it is lost via in the form of heat or general life processes carried out by the organisms in the trophic levels. Example, growth, movement, this requires energy, right? And hence, you know, the energy is not sufficient to support large number of organisms at the top comparing to the bottom. You can also talk about what, let's see. Okay, actually I have the three marks already. There's also another mark that you can talk about, which is not all organisms are eaten or digested. Right, despite at the bottom level, yes, you have a lot of organisms, but you must know that they are the ones at the top are hunting that which you know takes time, not exactly easy. So not all of them will die from you know from the hunting itself. So not all is eaten. So the energy conversion, like energy transfer from one tropic level to another is getting progressively lower due to the following reasons. All right, that's pretty much the discussion of this paper. Thank you so much for watching. And I hope that this paper will help you in your exams. And that's all. See you in the next one.